Great. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, we are Junior Achievement and we focus on K through 12 learning for um, focused on financial literacy, entrepreneurship, and career readiness. And we have a really awesome guest speaker today. Um, before I introduce her, I just kind of want to give everyone on the call today a little bit of an overview of how today's going to work. Um, so we have um, a very special guest today who will be presenting, um, but she'd love for her presentation to be interactive. So we really hope that those of you who are listening in can utilize our chat box throughout the entire session to type in any questions that you might have. Um, we ask that you mute your mic if you are not presenting and that you keep your video off so that we can make sure we have enough bandwidth um, so that we can all hear our awesome guest speaker today. Um, so to get us started, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our guest speaker today. So I'm super excited to introduce you to Cheryl Goodman, who is the head of corporate communications for Sony Electronics of North America. Cheryl has over 20 years of experience in technology, marketing, and business development, where she's been leading contributor to innovation, telecommunication ecosystems, and the use of technology to transform lives. Uh, Cheryl has an extremely impressive resume. Um, she spent 12 years at Qualcomm before she took on the role of CEO of the nonprofit Athena, which is designed to advance women in tech and life sciences. Um, now, she, like I said, she's the um, head of corporate communications for Sony Electronics um, and is a leading advocate for women and girls in STEM. She shares with us that she wants to bring the same mission focused mindset found in the nonprofit world and apply that to the world of technology, where her goal is to bring other high level contributors who sometimes get overlooked alongside her as she continues her journey to demonstrate how technology can transform lives. So thank you, Cheryl, so much for being with us today. I'm going to go ahead and pass over the presentation to you. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for taking time out of your day. It's certainly a privilege to be able to take a step back and look at things that have been impactful in the technology realm um, that have helped me. And I'm always eager to share uh, some of those observations over, over 20 years, but then also to a kind of a sub goal of this is to not only to tell you and to share with you and to dialogue with you, hopefully about these experiences, um, but to really see, share some learnings uh, about practically, you know, the emotional side of it, how you manage through the stress, especially the stressful times uh, that we're dealing with now with social unrest and COVID and everything being digital. So I know we're all a bit house happy and, and I hope everyone out there is well. And I just um, want to start off by saying thank you for your time. Uh, and then we'll just jump right in. So um, the uh, basic overview is what do I do at Sony? What, what's my job? Why do they pay me? Why do you care? It's really a neat, um, it's a neat position. And it really came through a culmination of experiences uh, that really speak to a, a theme, and that theme is um, analog to digital. So my the very first job was in uh, news in the newsroom here at the ABC affiliate. I also worked at the CBS affiliate, and believe it or not, I feel as old as a dinosaur when I tell you I set up the first website for Channel 10 KGTV uh, back in the day when uh, setting up a website. Um, was considered uh, really cannibalizing the TV news, which is crazy because, you know, now when we look at news, we get our news um, through social. Uh, so to think of um, a website as being perceived as disruptive to the news business was really archaic thinking. But that's the thinking that happens. And the strategic thinking is when business leaders try and forecast how new technologies will impact the consumer or you know, you know, what has to happen. And so from there, I went from really witnessing a radical change in how news was delivered uh, to onto another epic icon of digitization from, you know, back in the day where you had to listen to, uh, you really was as it was radio broadcast and physical medium formats. MP3.com was one of those organizations that had actually digitized software. It was a, the our our uh, the MP3 format, 
which was basically gave way to how we listen to music today. So my time there was really on the forefront of defending the technology before our legal system knew what to do with it. And this was an amazing journey coming straight from the newsroom with the same challenge uh, into uh, you know, uh, uh, music. And at that time, Sony was one of the top and continues to be music uh, companies. And so it was very interesting. I was actually on the opposite side of uh, Sony uh, nearly 20 years ago uh, from a litigation standpoint. Um, but it was because the technology was moving faster than understanding and it was moving faster than the pace of law. Uh, and many things were that ha had come from that. And that um, both of these experiences happening here in San Diego. So I would just say, you know, San Diego has this um, this um, sense that it's kind of a tourist town, a you know surfer town or whatever. But it but it's not. I've, I've never uh, uh, had a shortage of leading opportunities and innovation here in, in San Diego. And you can see that through. Then I followed through with it another company doing very similar things, but on the desktop with software and then over to Qualcomm. And when I was at Qualcomm, my first project really was to take my learnings from broadcast media and to see what would it take to have TV on a phone. And you know, back in that day, your phone either looked like a brick or it, it, it flipped open, you know, like a clamshell, right? And so the thought of TV on a phone back in those days was uh, certainly very promising in 2004, 2005, but we couldn't imagine our world today without that. So I've, again, been privileged to be on the forefront of that analog to digital transition. Um, and then as uh, mentioned earlier, I then left there and ran my own firm uh, for a number of years, then on to be a CEO of uh, um, executive director of uh, Athena. And this is important because it was in between Qualcomm and Athena that I really had to ask myself, what was my value and my total contribution uh, to this world and you know, beyond advancing technology and supporting the facilitation of technology, if that technology didn't solve for the digital divide, if that technology didn't equalize um, economic leveling. If we didn't do good with technology, then what good was it? And that was my mindset. And I, I resigned from from a what really wonderful position at at Qualcomm to start my own firm to address that. And one of my clients was, was Athena. And what we found is is that that really it it isn't uh, uh, the preconceived notions about women not being technically um, uh, adept. It really is about the ecosystem and finding opportunities and getting mentorship and having access and all of those things that are so important for societal change. And so I've been really privileged in those in those years to actually have a, a healthy income and a positive impact as a result of to combining two things that I love technology and social good and you know now I sit in this position that, that really was really bespoke and custom to these experiences that I had before of not only leading uh, corporate communications at Sony Electronics in the North American market, but also leading corporate social responsibility. So it's, it's a dream come true in the sense that if you do what you love, the opportunities will follow. And that's what I've been doing here at Sony. So now I'll tell you a, a bit about, well, what do I do exactly? What does that mean? Uh, CSR, corporate social responsibility. Well, number one, it means being aware, like what's happening in our world around us that's going to stumble or make our employees' lives difficult. Um, obviously, COVID has really uh, made everyone's lives difficult. And so we have more than 3,000 employees in the San Diego um, area. And, you know, COVID and obviously like many places we buildings are shut down and workforce and uh, many things happened as a result of that, but many unseen ripples, things such as all of our freelancers that use our gear to take um, to be wedding photographers or to be newsroom uh, photographers with $100,000 cameras, all of those economic cycles were disrupted. And so we really needed to show up to say, how can we help our community through giving and contributing dollars 
during this disruptive time. And so I had the privilege to be able to support the $100 million fund dissemination for COVID relief workers, disseminating masks and all those great things. So you could see it's a very impactful, it's a very impactful job, but it's also one where you have to be very cognizant. You have to be very aware of truly understanding what is the problem. And, you know, the catalyst for, there's many, um, many things that created the environment that we're in on social unrest. But the, one of the major catalysts was uh, COVID coming on and there being a tremendous impact in lower economic communities. And so it really unveiled really societal problems that, that we had had, that we had long been over, um, uh, that long been neglecting that needed to be addressed. And so when that reached ahead and, and the, the terrible incidents and tragic uh, incidents with George Floyd, you know, we knew as a company, a 110,000 person company, that we have influence over what we can do in our society and with our employees where they work. They need to be safe. They need to be heard. They need to be understood. They need to be resourced. And bottom line is we have to have dialogue. So a big part of my job is having a dialogue about understanding the needs of our global community and allocating resources appropriately. So how do we make those decisions? You know, if you look at the news, uh, you know, it's all day long uh, problems, you know, it, it can be overwhelming. Uh, so we get our, our guidance from the, you know, global organization, the United Nations, uh, and we really focus on these three key areas. This is a traditional fund in addition to the COVID fund and the, um, the um, social justice fund, but it really is about quality education. And so, Again, no, no greater privilege than to be able to speak to, to the Junior League today because it is so important that we understand what's required for the jobs of the future. And it's so important that we uncover the passions and the desires and the creative nature of, of everyone on this call to say, what, what is it that you're going to do? What are you going to bring to the world? And we can do that by partnering with the UN to understand what are the real issues and where are those issues. Um, obviously, gender equality is a big part of that, uh, but equality in economics is really the most important. Does everyone have access um, to jobs? You, know, you can't give everyone a job, but can we create ecosystems where there are job opportunities, whether it's through entrepreneurship, or um, traditional consumer electronics, that's also part of a CSR strategy because where there are jobs, there is economic um, uh, prosperity, there is home buying, there is needs are met. So it's a big part of what we do. And then finally, it's um, um, our green tech initiative. Sony um, has a very aggressive goal to have a zero carbon footprint. And we've talked often about what would it take as a consumer electronics manufacturer to minimize that, uh, we do things such as um, every TV that goes out can be recycled and then turned into another uh, Sony product that goes back to your house. So we're always thinking through our impact on the globe. Um, so that's how we make our decisions. Um, on the next slide, from a business perspective, you might ask yourself if you're sitting there, it's like, okay, well, if Sony makes you know, money, but then you turn around and you hand all of that money out. Where, how, do, how do you sell your products and your goods and services? We believe in, and I uh, would love to hear questions or thoughts or comments throughout um, this uh, talk on your beliefs on this is, is can you give back and create opportunity in the same time? And that really is our goal. And are we do that uh, in a number of ways? And so the number one thing that we say is if we give back, can we give back, say, for example, uh, you know, hundreds of cameras to document social injustice journeys? Can we um, provide equipment to organizations where mentorship is a big part of how um, women and underrepresented groups represent themselves? So we're always trying to tie our technology to these tangible outcomes. And thank goodness we are a number one camera manufacturer and leader, and, and we have really high standards of quality. And so we feel really good when we're able to tie those two things together. On the next slide, um, these are some of the organizations that we partnered with. Um, just very briefly uh, is uh, the broadcast community at large um, really needed 
for lack of a better word, benevolence. When, pe when people lost their jobs, they also lost access to food. Some people lost their housing. And we, we showed up in partnering with these organizations to try and solve for some of that through some of those resources. So it also becomes very practical. It's not just about the hardware, it's, also, it's, about, it's about the people. Um, the second part of this, and this is really the most important part, and you're gonna see a lot of this coming from Sony uh, in the coming months, actually a lot of this has started to activate. Um, and I'll ask you to go to the next slide of our biggest promotion right now, and it really is about um, your voice and your voting. And we partner with Black Votes, Voters Matter, specifically to highlight that in aggregate that we must use our voice to affect change we absolutely must and even if um you know you think there's no hope there certainly is no hope if there's no voice and you know many of you may not be uh ready to vote yet but our responsibility is to keep everyone informed so when it comes time for you to vote you're really up to speed on the issue. So this is a big partnership that we just launched for voter advocacy to give information about uh, what's next um, and your important role in that. So I'll take a breath for one second. And I'll just see if there's any questions that are coming in. Um, my, um, uh, I see one coming in there. Uh oh, I hope I didn't lose you guys. Nope, I think I still got you. Um, Okay, well, I, I didn't, uh, I thought I saw a question, but I did not. <laughs> so with that, uh, let me tell you some of my, the tips and tricks in my tool bag that's helped me get to where um, I am. And I, I will just say this, I, I grew up uh, one of five children, uh, very, very well below the economic poverty level. Um, and had a, a, a childhood that really, really afford me a whole lot of things. Um, and um, with that, you know, you, there's this hunger that you know things can be better. And so um, I say that to say that, you know, we don't all come in to this world with the legacy of wealth or, or anything else. Um, you know, there is inequality economically. Uh, in some ways from gender, from some ways from uh, uh, ancestral, and that we have to do the best that we can do as a community to help each other uh, equalize where there hasn't been prior equalization. So a lot of th these tips and tricks and, and things that I wanna share with you are my personal experience about how to battle things such as fear. And fear is something that is prevalent, especially now. And so I just want to talk to you just a bit about my personal uh, philosophy on that. So when I think about fear, I think about um, something that is, 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 I think about being incredibly accurate in my analysis of fear. Oftentimes, especially when we're, I don't know, presenting or doing something that's scary to us, our mind will take us so far away than the actual real fear. And I would just challenge each of you is when you start to be afraid, whatever it is, whether it's a homework assignment or whatever it might be to really ask yourself, is this worth fear? Is, you know, because it can be very um, self-defeatist. On the next slide, I want to talk a little bit about when we don't embrace our fear, when we don't manage our fear, we lose opportunities to have impact. Um, there is a, a phrase um, that Theodore Roosevelt, and, and hopefully you can see that, that slide, that really talks about success is had when you step into the arena. Fear will not let you step into the arena. Fear will, you will be the person on the sidelines critiquing the person in the arena. And so I guess what the key message that I want to say is you can't have impact if you let fear be your guide. And so to minimize fear uh, as much as you can. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the ways, ways to do that. Um, because one thing that we know for sure is it doesn't matter what you do. Haters going to hate. Okay. So even if you did something perfectly, someone will be uh, dissension will, will happen. And so I just want to 
share with you is that you can't have fear or you shouldn't rather have fear based in trying to please people because pleasing people is important when we're uh, seeking to understand, but it may not be the number one thing when it comes time to execute and to make an impact. On the next slide, uh, another quote from Marcus Aurelius who really talks about, and this is such a great, I wish I had a big poster of this, is that we never um, give our, so we give so much power to others when we allow them to critique us. And so just to keep in mind is that your instinct and your gut and your passions, you really should trust those. Um, you know, and again, seeking counsel along the way, but it, it's really an, an an important piece of information in my humble opinion. But, you know, fears and phobias are different though. You know, there's a, there's a couple of different ways to sort them aside, not to be too overwhelming, but I'm gonna show you what the top 10 fears are. I, and they're funny, they kind of make me laugh because I think I have more, more of those than I would like, especially, especially the bug one. Ugh. But, uh, you know, the, your mind will trick you whether you're going to have a presentation, you know, there are things that happen to you in, in the fear moment that really compromise your, your long-term thinking. And so, uh, again, if, the, if you see something on this list, really ask yourself, what, what's, what's really driving that? What's really making that um, happen? So I'm going to take a breath and I'm going to pause and I'll see, because I'm not seeing questions come in, maybe, maybe they're there, maybe they're not. <laughs> Uh, but if there is a Georgia or others that want to uh, flag a question, I um, certainly will stop talking for a moment to answer. Okay. Moving right along. Just oh, want to make, oh, Sharon, you got one. I, yes. Well, awesome. I, it's Georgia and <laughs> um, I, oh, it looks like there is something that just came Oh, someone said, will we get a copy of this? <laughs> um, we'll get a copy. Yes. And um, I wanted, I know that you're going to get into this in the presentation, um, but as a, and as a speaker, um, what is your, which is the number one public speaking fear on this list? And as you know, I have a major fear of public speaking. What do you think is the number one thing that you can do to approach that? And why do you think that that's the number one fear? Well, it's a great question, Georgia. And our, our long history really makes us uh, afraid in any situation where you're standing or even sitting as I am in an, in an open environment with thousands of things looking at you, right? Our DNA says, oh, you're about to get eaten by a lion. You probably want it. Your heart's going to race. You're probably going to sweat a little bit. You're, you know, your, 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 your body is going to take over. And that's when you have to remember that, you know, you, you are in control of your body and that even deep breathing, yeah, you know, your parasympathetic system is going to force you to slow down any situation of fear, deep breathe, whether it's being pulled over or, you know, being late to a meeting or public presenting, deep breathing is really key. The second thing is, if you have been equipped with the message, you have something important to say, you owe the world the responsibility to be calm and cool and collected so you can deliver that message, right? Because it's really not about the individual. So, you know, my presentation to you today isn't about me per se, it's about do I have something that I learned that I think would be valuable? And if so, it's my burden to be as clear as possible with you. And when we have a mission focused mindset, when we're delivering information, then it becomes less about, oh, how did my hair look? Or did I do this? Or did I do that? And so to really uh, remember your mission, remember your message and deliver that message because only you can understand that. Thank you. And I think that your next slide kind of says that I'm not alone. <laughs> <laughs> you are not alone, Georgia, and you are a fabulous public speaker, I might add. Uh, so interestingly enough, a lot of the research um, that I have commissioned when I was running Athena was really about, well, why, why do women typically, and I hate to stereotype, that's a, that's a problem, but why do we 
typically have fear of speaking, but women more so having fear of speaking. And that's because of um, many things we don't see. And, uh, and I would say historically in my career, especially in technology realms, I was generally the only female in the room for many, many years. And that included all the way up until I ring in Athena. I was the only woman in the room. And so I didn't see a whole lot of other women doing what I was attempting to do. There was some, you know, kind of tapes running in my head or narratives running in my head is that, oh, well, I don't do this. I'm supposed to support the person that's supposed to do that. But that that's not true. It's like your own power is so important to leverage your own power. So to, to minimize that fear. And I would just challenge each of you to say whether it's fear of public speaking or fear of speaking in a group setting where you have something, a uh, contribution to make is don't let fear take over that, take that opportunity from you because that's how you're going to grow. And that's how you're going to put plant that flag out there that you have this mission, you have this mindset, you have this goal of whether the goal is to learn and to become an expert, whatever it is, the world doesn't know it unless you say it. So uh, don't be afraid. Another thing that we tend to do uh, is to really um, tell ourselves stories. And, you know, maybe it's, it, it's kind of like a bit of a psychology lesson here. So I, I apologize in advance, but I think it's really important, especially if any of you have an aspiration to be an executive. And because you need to be as an executive balanced, calm, factual, data driven, you need to um, bolster your employees, you need to be a contributor in your community. There's so many things that you can do that you can't afford kind of stinking thinking. And stinking thinking would be is every situation, either you're a villain, you know, there's a villain, there's a victim, and there's a hero. And you know what, sometimes it's not, sometimes it is what it is. And then we really need to ask questions. If we're feeling distension with someone, or we're um, challenged to understand how we're to work together, how we're to achieve a big mission, it really is go find the evidence of the things that you think. If you think someone's evil, go find the evidence. Work with them till you understand either they truly are or they're, they're not. But more often than not, we build these narratives in our heads so we really need to silence our, our voice there. Uh-oh. I think I got dropped there. Can, okay, can, can you, you still hear me? Okay, I got a sign that said I got dropped, but I guess I didn't. All right, so now segueing uh, on to, um, well, so how do you, what are, what are other, uh, what I would call untapped uh, equity that's on the table for, for women? And that really is the power of personal branding. I would say that this was um, um, an aspiration uh, for this should be an aspiration of many of you. And in, as you think about your portfolio and you know, the job that you want, you know, maybe this is nascent, this is emerging. Maybe you don't have a whole lot of proof points, but your proof point is your goal. What is your goal? Find someone to mirror and to mentor. So you could say, hey, this is something that I wanna do and I wanna act in this way and I wanna look um, you know, uh, to have the same type of job or so forth. To really identify what that is and then start to, to build that. I did just see a question come in uh, about what has been my biggest hurdle in my career. Um, and it, it really was um, overcoming uh, fear. And it wasn't so much public speaking because as a broadcaster um, or in broadcast uh, industry, I had been trained really to speak to a camera. And so no problems fundamentally presenting. But my biggest fear really was presenting in boardrooms, in smaller um, uh, situations where there would be a lot of dialogue. And I'd have to remember and to remind myself that as long as you know what you're talking about and you have that mission, that message, then really all that other stuff should go along the wayside. So that was always been a big challenge of mine. The second challenge has been really making sure that just because I don't look like everyone in the room, and thank God, uh, there are more people in my organization. Uh, there's great diversity in my organization. Now the working conditions are so much better now than they, they were. But that was typically this, the scenario is that I didn't feel 
included. And I would have to remind myself is that I'm being included. Uh, you know, you hear getting a seat at the table. Uh, you know, sometimes I didn't want to sit at the table. Sometimes I just wanted to build a whole new conference room or, you know, or you hear, yeah, we'll bring up your folding chair. And, you know, and I think, um, you know, when I was thinking about leaving Qualcomm, which is a really wonderful company with phenomenal technology, but, you know, predominantly men, um, you know, that was a big decision for me because I was walking away from a really great salary, amazing access in terms of technology information, but I knew that I personally wasn't satisfied and so that I could apply that learning to something that solved for social good in a, in a social good way. And while that path, you know, was kind of a long path from the 2013 until 2017 when I joined Sony, I didn't really get to activate that on the ma major scale. And so Athena, great organization for women's empowerment, um, local, uh, where now we're looking at major UN-led organizations, UN-led social responsibility, UN-led technology imperatives. And those are the things that if I had let fear, you know, manage me, then I would have never sought for these high visible experiences. Uh, but the net net is, is that you own your contribution, know your contribution. And if you don't know it yet, think about it, watch it marinate on it, find it, you know, have those conversations to uncover that. All right, kind of went on a rant there. <laughs> All right, so but personal branding is a really interesting one. And I think I'm going to go through this uh, uh, really quickly from a, a female executive standpoint. There are a lot of women that will say, that's just bragging. You know, you're always posting on LinkedIn, or you're always doing this. And it's like, how does the world know what you want, what you're about, unless you're not doing that? You know, um, it doesn't get stated without you. And so to think about your personal branding from everything from the images that you're putting on the internet about yourself and, and uh, wonderful young folks, word of advice to you, and Georgia knows this very well, we work with teams of influencers, amazing influencers that really help us tell our story. And any of those influencers that have compromising content, polarizing content, you know, profanity or anything, it really can stop people from having fantastic jobs. And so I would just uh, remember that everything that you bring to the internet, really, there's no eraser, you know, you can try and hide it but to really be careful about how you manage your brand, what you do with your brand, because your brand is you. Uh, and so, A, take advantage of those opportunities, but be conscientious that there is a downside to that. Now, why is your personal brand important? Uh, well, think about if you were to sell a house and you had you know, no image of it, you couldn't talk about the features of it, um, there is no, you can't demonstrate curb appeal. You know, you have to demonstrate either what it is you aspire to be, what you aspire to do, um, and you have to put a stake in the ground somewhere because the world isn't, there's no fortune tellers out there. And if they are, you probably don't want to work for a fortune teller, you probably want to work for a fortune 500. So get your brand out there so people can engage and dialogue with you of what you're interested in. And so in order for to do that, you really have to demonstrate actual value. And actual value looks like sharing things that maybe folks don't know, your observations that are unique. Um, and we really need to just broaden the things again that, that we have um, great um, interest in. So we'll go to the uh, next slide. So um, it's important too, obviously, because this is your competition. Uh, you know, the democratized world, of uh, social media, LinkedIn, and all of these great things means that at a drop of a hat, any position, uh, especially you know positions that uh, we actually have an open position now, uh, they get about a thousand applicants, and that's in just a couple of days. And so you know if you're looking at a career where your personal brand may be part of that, you want to get into video, you want to get in. Um, to anything, you really have to make sure that you are the top of the stack in terms of your, your you know, that you can be your competition. Um, but we know that sometimes that's not uh, realistic. You know, we take it one step at a time. We do what we can because the reality is, now that's not my actual kitchen, but that's kind of 
how difficult life is, right? We try and balance the things we must do for caring for our families and caring for our homes and, you know, caring for whether it's our parents or children or, or our brothers and our sisters, um, our community, uh, and then still somehow we're supposed to be Wonder Woman. It's a tall order. And I would just say, this is the part where you really need to, to find that person that you aspire to, that you admire, and to really under, uncover what those steps you need to take to have balance and, and to, but also to thrive. And I will say this, if you're comfortable, you're not growing, right? We have everything that we need to do, it should have some level of discomfort uh, to it. Uh, because the, the flip side of fear, you know, I talked about the negative side, but the positive side is, you know, you stress, positive stress, is a catalyst, and so to convert those fe that fear into things that will actually, you know, uh, broaden your horizons in terms of uh, elevating your benchmarks. So I see a few more questions uh, come in. The next few slides really are going to talk about um, the mechanics um, of that, and um, I am just looking at these questions to make sure. Oh, lots of nice positive comments. Thank you so much. So I'm happy to share my experience. Um, did I struggle with equal pay in my career? Yes, I did. I did uh, for a very long time. Uh, you know, one of the things that makes me so happy to work for Sony is, and as a matter of fact, I think I have a slide that speaks to that. And why don't we just move uh, forward, George, and we'll go straight to, um, we'll leave some of the brand stuff is um yep skip that one there you go skip that we talked about that um this one right here will hold on this is one of the things that i liked about um sony is that they were a member of athena and um, so was qualcomm uh many companies are uh they have some affiliation uh, uh but they had made the commitment to equalize pay um a number of years ago uh far before it was uh, fashionable and there was always audits on that so it's not like a one and done um, but for many years um, not only did I know I was making less it was kind of it was not an issue it was something that was like oh well you know you can't travel as much and you have you know a child I have two sons um, both are over the age of 18 and and two stepdaughters and so uh, you know the there was pay disparity. There was disparity in the types of projects that I would be assigned. And the only reason that I was able to get assignments that had high value is because I had to ask and I had to be uncomfortable. I'd be uncomfortable in that, that, okay, maybe I didn't have experience in that particular area, but what would it take for me to be able to, uh, you know, dip my toe in into that area? And that area was really business development. So I was trained as a, um, a journalist, worked as a journalist, um, but then really crossed over into business development to work with publishers to help design their new strategies for um, e-readers and tablets. And I did that because I knew the industry so well. Uh, but the hurdles were, no one was handing me that opportunity. I had to knock on many, many doors to be able to uh, really grow and expand um, those areas uh, that I was interested in. And it didn't uh, happen quickly. It never does. But, you know, in hindsight, uh, you know, if we don't ask, you, you don't get. And so you have to be very vocal. One part of being vocal, I'll speak just straight to this slide, is being vocal is showing up local, right? And so if uh, just as a junior league itself, a great association, um, when you start to identify what career path that you want to go in, uh, you really need to find the uh, association that's uh, narrowly focused on that or exclusively focused, I should say, on, on that particular discipline. And I think um, because of COVID now, many of these organizations are democratized. Obviously, it would be a lot harder for us all to get into a room. But, you know, the, the upside is, is that you can join a number of uh, organizations um, uh, to advance uh, your career and your understanding. And it's really an imperative in order of growing your network beyond just social media. You got to do the real thing with real people too. Okay. 
Uh, so we have about uh, 15 minutes before this closes, and I know you guys close right on time. So I have a few more slides uh, to go through, and really I'll just go towards my personal uh, philosophy. So if we just go down a few more slides, uh, Georgia, is, is I just want to share with you some statistics, okay? And you can, you can read the slide, so I don't have to read it to you necessarily. Um, but women, the big issue for, for women and uh, any compromise group that isn't uh, on an equal playing field is that you will retire with less money. And this is important because you, you really need to accumulate wealth over time so you can have choices. So when I talk about technology and economic leveling, it really is about so you can choose. So you can choose where you want to go to school, so you can have choice. So economic choices are so important to this. And that's why not only is it the right thing to do, it's actually good for business. And this is the part that uh, corporate America and Sony is very cognizant of, which is why it's a wonderful company, is, is that when we don't have all voices as part of a conversation, uh, you're myopic, you're, you're lopsided, you, you miss opportunities. Companies that are, have more uh, women board members actually have higher revenue and uh, they have uh, lower risk. And so we know not only is it, a, you know, again, good business, uh, it's, it is the right thing to do. Okay, so George, I see another question. Oh wait, what is my favorite part about working at Sony? Um, and then I also see what sets a candidate apart from others. So let me talk about the favorite part about uh, Sony. Um, Sony um, is a, a multinational company. And I mentioned they have 110,000 employees. From a t sheer technology standpoint, every sensor in, uh, whether it's in autonomous cars or the multiple sensors in your phone, um, everything is sensing. And so um, Sony is the number one mobile, uh, number one uh, sensor provider with the most market share. That just means this is an area we dominate in. Sensors are so key to every piece of technology that, that we interact with today. If they were to all be illuminated, like throughout the room, you saw every sensor, you would be absolutely amazed. But it's what's driving not only 5G, it's driving Internet of Things. It's driving everything we do in our digital economy. So Sony is a fantastic place to work at because of the, just the sheer technology underpinnings. Then you add to that the uh, music um, catalog that we have. We have the world's largest music collection. Uh, and this was uh, something that's been accumulated since the late, the late 80s. But the largest collection. We also have the largest publishing. Uh, we also have a major studio. So when we think about um, an ecosystem, you have Sony shooting uh, 4K movies that are being bespoke and custom to the TV that you watch, to the headphones that you wear. So it was, it's really a wonderful technology company. But none of that would matter if women didn't have a role or if um, your ancestral makeup somehow compromised you from opportunity. None of that would matter. And one thing that's uh, for certain, and it's the reason why I work at Sony, is because diversity is front and center in the core values. Diversity in thought, diversity in business, diversity in, in, in our employee makeup, and it's part of, of management criteria, which means that as I manage my staff, I have to account for where are we thinking diverse? How are we uh, leading? And when anything that's measured matters. And so that's why I uh, really enjoy working for Sony. Uh, in addition to, um, you know, Sony really showed up well for uh, COVID and, you know, we $200 million towards social justice. So, you know, there's a lot of pride for a company that really acknowledges they have a role. We have a role to play in society and to put on not only our money where our mouth is, but to show up not with solutions, but to show up aware and open and listening and collaborating to solve for these highly complex problems. And so that, that's a long-winded answer uh, of why I uh, enjoy working for Sony. 
Okay, and then the second question was, um, how do you suggest I further encourage my 16 year old daughter to explore it? Uh, uh, thing it's theme and I see that's from Dale hi Dale how are you um you know that's so important uh you know I think as a mom of two boys both who are very very mechanical when I would talk about steam especially when I was running Athena they kind of would roll their eyes at me but believe it or not that's what they're doing whether we want to call it steam or not everything has a component of technology to it everything there's very few things that are produced and manufactured and sold whether it's a pair of socks or a tv there is technology and everything and and I, I would just say that um highlighting careers that demonstrate that steam is especially and we say stem steam steam careers uh really are relying upon creativity there's an assumption that that arts portion is maybe off to its side you know science technology technology engineering math and arts arts and math uh but it's not it, you know it's central to our business uh, uh having the world's largest collection of music our major studio it's driven by creativity so to where you can draw the parallels of creative and technology that these two worlds are couldn't be tighter aligned i think folks will will get excited and i know um even from a gaming perspective, if we look at, you know, on the Sony gaming side, um, there, that requires some incredible innovative uh, thinking that's not just rooted in technology skills, but in creative thought and what we would call cre creative um, IP. Okay, and then I see a question coming in from you, Sid. Uh, talked about local trade industry group. What role, if any, has your social capital, your network, played in each of your career moves across the industries what would you tell our students about the importance or not of it Whew, big question good one said now i know why you're ceo great question <laughs> so social capital i, I love that term um, because it, it, it's a play on equity value social value so i kind of got a big mouth um and I, I you know after years of saying find your voice don't be afraid um become that expert so that you minimize fear as doing that has given me a lot of confidence and if you're on linkedin or uh, if you want a linkedin send me a linkedin invite you'll see i probably do two or three posts a day about the things that i'm so proud of and then i'm flagging to my community i think i i don't know how many people are on, on my linkedin account i guess it's irrelevant but the net net is when i'm flagging and posting things that we care about then that comes back to me so it's a that social capital is invested in anything um that we do has compounding effects whether it's good habits or bad habits and the compounding effect of being persistent on communicating the things that you care about and doing that uh with with care articulate that uh, with a clear call to action, then you are going to build your social capital. You are going to build your social equity. You will find opportunities. And I, I, I couldn't believe, I couldn't believe more in the format of social media to achieve that goal, to achieve dialogue, uh, not for, you know, self-flattery or for uh, any of the other ways that we sometimes tend to use social media for dialogue. It is the most important, and it's the thing that really drives um, change is, is dialogue. So, okay, there we go. So the bottom line, um, this, uh, and I'll close it out with the kind of final thoughts here is uh, you have to know your value. You're, uh, uh, as middle schoolers, high schoolers, young adults, you're still trying to figure out what that is. Uh, and that's okay, but you have to know and you have to explore and you have to understand and only you can do that. Um, you have to articulate your brand. What does that mean? Well, you have to execute against the way you think that should look and what that should be like. That means you gotta do a lot of homework to research what resonates with you, what, what you know, intrigues you. And I think that's really um, important. Um, and you have to identify your path. Um, and I would just say that you hear a lot uh, about, and you've heard this from me, but you hear a lot of women's groups specifically saying, find your voice, raise your hand, take a seat at the table. And that's true. But do that when you have managed your fear through uh, being a subject matter expert. 
So your research and your understanding and your thoughtfulness and your commitment to your craft is really going to advise that your quality contribution. And I believe that uh, we all have uh, a mission and a quality comp contribution to make. Um, and uh, that is a, a collection of things. And so with that, I think I'm, I'm in, the, in the final end there. I see one more question uh, there. Oh, uh, the question was, what sets a candidate apart from others? Hiring. Okay, so I'll close out with um, what am I looking for? What do a lot of hiring managers look for? And you know, look for, you look for commitment uh, and you know, there's a lot of dialogue about, oh, do you need a college degree or do you not need a college degree? And in my humble opinion, it's, it's the right thing to do. However, what it says is your commitment. That says I was committed for four years and um, that I was able to see that through. And so when I'm looking at resumes, I'm looking for commitments that are over one year. I'm looking for three years, two to three years, right? Um, I'm also looking for a broad network that you know what's happening in general, right? That you're aware of, of things that are relevant, especially in um, my industry, the industry of news and communications on uh, corporate social responsibility. Every morning, we have to know what's going on. We do a full analysis every morning and send in a report out to our executives at eight o'clock every morning that covers everything from international relations to product launches, uh, to competitive analysis. And so I would say be um, aware and demonstrate your um, uh, awareness. And then, you know, I touched on this earlier, really um, making sure that things that don't support that are not accessible. Uh, privatize your networks. If you're on Facebook and you, you know, you're or some other platform and you have friends and you think this isn't content that I want to be accessible, I would just say that just be really cautious about what you're putting out there and to, to privatize where you can because it will cost you jobs. There are people that um, have missed out on really wonderful opportunities in the, in the corporate culture by not really understanding the negative and positive power of social media. So there you go. All right. Well, I think, uh, I think that pretty much wraps it up for me. I, I will say this. I am uh, accessible on all social handles. Uh, Twitter, CK Goodman. Um, would love to connect with you and share all of those things that uh, we do uh, at Sony because, you know, things like Black Voters Matter, our vote.com support, our support with the UN, all of these things are accessible uh, to you with the democratized information that we have participate, participate in that. I'd love to have a conversation with you and I will officially stop talking and see if there are other questions to be asked. Um, well, Cheryl, I think there's one that came in around the importance of branding. Um, I think from Deanne, uh, you spoke about the importance of branding with the huge influence of social media on you today. What advice would you give to them or to your sons to ensure success in their future career? Oh, gosh, it's such a big and important question. You know, because I was trained classically as a journalist, there is, a, we are in such crisis and truth. And it, everyone needs to understand the motivations behind every published piece. It's the reason that Wall Street Journal, New York Times, LA Times, our media means something that, you know, it's our, our freedom of the press means something. Just because you can post and publish doesn't mean you know what you're talking about, nor does it mean that it, it is uh, credible or curated or fact-checked. And I would just say this is please understand um, that it is our responsibility to know what the true issues are. And then if you're digesting a lot of social media and you, you don't know where it's coming from, it's, it's really never good. And so I'd say support your uh, local journalist organizations. As I, my favorites are NPR.org, um, obviously, because uh, they're a nonprofit committed to truth. AP, Associated Press, another.org. They're um, definitely committed to truth. Reuters, really ask yourself, how am I getting this information? Because it is our number one crisis. It affects COVID. 
It affects our social justice issue. It affects our voting campaigns. And you absolutely need to know that. And I'm so happy my son has taken a journalism college and I continue to tell him, this is to your most important class that you're gonna to take to understand how media works because it is how we are manipulated. It's how we are lied and deceived. And if we don't take that on our own personal responsibility to seek truth, then I think the problems will continue. So went on a rant there. Sorry about that. <laughs> Feel strongly about it. <laughs> okay, any other questions? All Great. Right. Well, if there aren't any more questions, I just want to thank you, Cheryl, so much for joining us today and for sharing about your career pathway and the things that are so important to you and your role. Um, and thank you for Sony for um, being a part of this as well. So with that, I think we'll end today's session. Um, and thank you again so much. Yes, thank you. And it's a wonderful organization. You have great leadership and impactful, important mission stay connected and i look forward to seeing you out in the social media sphere awesome thank you guys so much thank you everyone for joining thank you cheryl all right bye, -bye.